started doing this in 2001. I've been 20 years on this field. Um, see the field maturing a lot, growing a lot. Uh, we got way better to treat patients, and mm. I think it remains to me the most passionate thing is to see the impact that you make in each human life that we touch. So it's still very exciting. Specifically talking about uh, aneurysms, right. the role of surgery, in my view, became smaller. Uh, but we still use surgery in, in many cases. I think still surgery is superior in some specific cases. Well, you should be talking about like clipping or something like that. Yes, yes. So like, for example, a ruptured aneurysm with a large clot. Mm -hmm. I think it still makes sense to do a craniotomy to clip an aneurysm. Um, in, in some patients, younger patients, where the aneurysm is complex and you want to avoid patients from being on aspirin plavix for a long time, a young female considering uh, having a child that could be a problem on blood thinner, so that there's still some considerations where where clipping uh, still fits on the the whole toolbox. Is there something of a, a movement or a hybrid kind of uh, intervention where you would do a, a clipping and use the device? Yes, yeah, so so not for the same patient, but but we do have, it, especially in the United States and in, in some countries in Japan, in Japan, for example, every single intervention is. Uh, is a uh, neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. um, now you see neurologists come to the field, the same mm -hmm. thing in China. Um, so I think the training of having all these tools available makes a lot of sense in many areas. Uh, uh, naturally, I'm biased because I'm a neurosurgeon right. by training, uh, but, but I think it's super nice. Carotid, for example, uh, when you see a patient, you can offer this patient a carotid and nerve or a T-car or a carotid stent through a radio or femoral approach. So you have all the options there to discuss and I think that's with what, the patient, with the patient, with the patient. And I think that's what makes it, it super nice, because sometimes you have a team with different specialties, but the parts of the team don't talk to each other. This is a human relationship, and mm. so egos get on the way. Uh, when you have all these tools available, you can definitely pick and choose and say, look, for this patient, this modality makes more sense. For another patient, another modality mm. makes more sense. So I think it's super nice to have the surgical background. It's not uncommon that you tell the patient you have more than one good option. And I'm Engaging the patients in their own care. Is ab a absolutely. And, and human, all in school, we are in religion, we can have a long discussion about that. Wrong, right, wrong, right, mm -hmm. wrong, right. I tell the patients, look, sometimes you have more than one right answer. Right. Uh, and engaging the patient on the ups and downs of each one of the modalities, I think is super uh, nice. Uh, and the patients really enjoy that. You ask me about my uh, how does clipping fits on this right. uh, uh, mini stents like Atlas. We don't have a Leo baby, but these stents that go through a 17 microcatheter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like Elvis Jr. or Atlas, and the endosacular device like Web that we mm -hmm. have now, a Web 17 available in the United States, and we're just starting. Actually, we just did the first two patients in the United States in Jacksonville uh, this month. So these tools, no question will push surgery more to a corner because it's about the ease of use and improved results for the patient. Uh, so okay. no question that these tools uh, will, will make this the procedure and the vascular treatment of animals easier. I still use for patients with no unruptured animals, I still use uh, do antiplatelet aspirin and plavix or equivalent if they're resistant to that. Uh, but I, I, I'm much more liberal in stopping these medications sooner to compare, for example, to a flow diverter stent where you keep these patients on a longer period of time on these medications. So uh, I just treated a patient with a liver disease with a web device. Again, this guy need his animals treated to go on a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. This is not a good person to be using aspirin and plavix for a long time. So you treat this patient with a web, Five days later, you stop the aspirin and plavix, and he is ready uh, to go for his liver transplant whenever the transplant team decide for that. So the endosacular treatment allows you to, to do that. So it eases patient selection for a lot of these procedures. Correct. And the safety profile, that's one thing we learned with the web, that mm -hmm. this is a very safe procedure. Mm -hmm. So we can use that and, again, pick and choose what fits better to each one of the patients. So, mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, last comments on how you see this going in the future? Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's very, very nice to see this uh, showcase here link with uh, Dr. Pereira, that is a dear Brazilian fellow <laughs> yes. uh, and friend and brother. Uh, I think we're going to see a revolution in terms of how we do this. I think robotics will play a major role and it's so mm -hmm. cool to see a guy like Jacques uh, 
uh, seeing that because it's not the way it's happening right now is what's going to be in five years. And a wise man once said, never bet against technology and look where we are today with right. iPhone 13 just coming out. Right. Uh, again, this is, again, the robot will get better. Uh, which direction is going to go? It's going to be exciting in the next five years to watch or this is going to be better. No question, we're going to continue to get better on the best interest of the patient.